Welcome to CBAW Loves, a book club podcast from Community Building Artworks. I'm Seema Ressa. And I'm Amelia Bain. Each episode, Seema and I will invite a rotating cast of fellow writers and artists to discuss a book that we love. We hope you'll read along and join the conversation. Welcome back to CBAW Loves. Today we're discussing The Secret to Superhuman Strength by Alison Bechdel. Seema and I are joined by Nisha Gupta, Rachel Heath, Tarfia Faizula, Amber Flame, and Maiden Wood, who you'll hear introducing themselves now. I am Nisha Gupta. I am a psychology professor at the University of West Georgia and also a creative of different types of mediums. And I love Alison Bechdel's work, especially the psychology of her work. I've kind of, you know, the psychoanalysis of her previous book and the whole existential Buddhist lens of this book tracks with my own psychology studies. I'm Maiden Wood. I am a writer and illustrator with a background in single panel comics, which is certainly about one millionth of what Alison Bechtel has done in this book. My name is Amber Flame. I am a creator and performer. Um, I write many kinds of things. And I am also the program director at Hedgebrook, which is a writing residency for women identified folk. And I am um, also getting old and hurting for no reason and a dyke to watch out for. So I feel especially in love with um, this book in particular and glad to be discussing it. Hi, I'm Tarfia. I am a gentlewoman at large, I've decided for today. I literally just finished reading this book half an hour ago. So I also am curious to know what I think about it. My name is Rachel Ray. I'm the director of curriculum and coaching for the Unicorn Authors Club, also a writer, um, also an artist of many different things. Um, and I'm excited to talk about this book. I think it's interesting. We've read memoirs by Alison Bechdel for years of different like parts of her life, but this is the thread that's run through all of it. It's her body right? It's it's the thread. And I didn't realize how little I think about my body as a thread that's running through my life, which is wild to me. Thank you for that. Because it's wild. It's wild that you, like, I went, oh, shit. Yeah. I feel like I'm doing that now, which is what it also feels like she did. Like, at some point, she she realized, like, oh, this is the thread to connect. Or maybe she realized that as she kind of revealed, like, I didn't know how to do this book or how to write it or what I'm writing about. I love that too. The like re- the slow reveal of that, of like we're being documented in the process of documenting, which was a really, that was really fascinating. I think because, so I grew up with like no TV, no movies. I grew up in a very fundamentalist Christian church. And so when I found Dykes to Watch Out For at Half Price Books in Seattle, Washington, when I came out and went to college and like the whole world opened up and I was like, oh my God, public gay people, um, women with short hair. And so it was interesting to feel how I thought I knew her because of this comic strip and to see the back end of her creating that comic strip. It did something to the picture of all of that. And it did something to my own context of all of that to see that she like... This was something, this was like her daily grind, right? And to know that she was really retreated from the active activism scene, (laughs) like that she had spent most of her time hiding in the woods, essentially, that was also really revealing to me. And I was like, wow, what privilege. And so I've been ruminating on that, like how we become observers, even when we're maybe even especially as we become the, the known documentarians of when we become the one known for writing this kind of work or doing this kind of activity, at some point we spend a lot more time talking about it than doing it, right? Yeah, I definitely felt like there was such a huge thread of self-awareness in this book of her like really making the effort to be honest with herself about herself, which is also fascinating in conjunction with the idea that there's not a self. And sort of her grappling with that, like, how does one square accountability with, like, egolessness and not having selfhood? And there was one section that really struck me 
I think the most out of anything in the book, which was she was talking about the transcendent belief that we are all one and said something along the lines of, I realized that my desire to transcend being a person was also self-isolating, that it was like about evading the discomfort of the actual everyday reality of subject and object that like, just because you have decided we're all one doesn't mean everyone you interact with also thinks I am you and you are me. And it's uncomfortable. I think we can all be, all be one, but sharing a POV isn't a reality or a fact of our existence. So it, that was the most striking point of the book to me. And maybe in some ways her effort to acknowledge that like, the effort to be enlightened, even if it's in pursuit of egolessness, is still a way to remove yourself from society. Yeah, I think the Buddhist um, thread of this was really interesting. And the self-awareness, like you said, I'm just thinking about even the self-reflection of what was um, behind the curtains of Fun Home and was it Are You My Mother? It was like very meaningful, this book, to see that, what was happening behind the curtains and where Allison has come to in her life through her journey. Um, I had a gay dad that also died tragically in an accident that was um, an ambiguous accident and was coming out as, you know, I guess, pansexual through coming out about my dad being in the closet. And so Fun Home was such an essential um, memoir for me. It, you know, and it was just so life-changing. It came at the right time. And so I became like very clingy to her work um, and identified with it very strongly. And then I found, you know, then she did her second one um, book was about her relationship with her mother in the context of, of their queer family and the traumas that they all experienced. And I could identify with that. And I was working through my own relationship with my mother who was married to my dad, you know. But what I love about this book is her attempt through Buddhism to transcend the trauma narratives a little bit. I mean, they're there. Like she's so intellectualized and I can relate to that as a professor, as a scholar of psychology and the way that she uses fitness and her, you know, relationship with her body to offset the intellectualism and how it just keeps creeping in, you know, it's such a, I mean, it's so fascinating, the mind body connection and I think that's what I found most beautiful about this book is her constant attempt to live in her body and not and not be able to escape the intellectualization of that, uh, which kind of is just an endearing attempt at enlightenment that no humans can actually do. But I just like applaud her ability to try. Um, it was a massive feat. Yeah. I have to admit that I found parts of it pretty unrelatable personally, because I didn't grow up athletic and there was, I had an, which I've referred to before, I had an early injury that kind of prevented me from being in my body in a lot of ways. I think that for the first part of it, I was kind of like, I felt a little bit sometimes like must be nice about her ability to be that athletic and to touch on Amber's point about privilege. There are parts of it that I was sort of like very aware of the fact that this is like a a pretty white vantage point, even in terms of the inspiration, like folks like Wordsworth or even like Jack Kerouac. I was just like, I never, I don't know. Like I didn't really, I had friends who were really into Jack Kerouac bros. I went to high school with who were into Jack Kerouac. So I found parts of her journey. um, I found it a little bit unrelatable, but like a few of you have already said, I really admire Bechdel's just ability to track her own life, I guess. Like there was a moment where she was talking about how she, for the first year ever, and I think in her 40th year, did not document her body because she had been documenting the disintegration of her body for a long time. And I thought parts of that were just incredibly fascinating, just her absolute diligence about recording her own life, I think was very inspiring. I feel you, Tarfia. I was excited about this book when I heard about what it was about. And then when I started reading it, I was, there were so many voices in my head was like, must be nice to be able to go to like the hippie women's festival and not stick out like a sore thumb and have people ask you what brought you here? You know, it must be nice to be able to have these kinds of anchors in nature in a way that's so incredibly like open and fun. And, you know, we're going skiing. I'm like, 
that there is a place of privilege there that again, this was one of those people where I was like, I want to relate to you. And I see you like sharing your trauma so freely and openly. And there's the Buddhist connection and there's the, you know, trying to embody connection, but there's also this voice in my head saying, but there's still so much privilege there. There's still so much privilege there. How do I relate to this person? I definitely had these moments where I was like, it must, it, it must be nice. Right. Um, but also I want this for me and I want this for, I, I want to be able to talk about how um, like almost a week and a half ago, I don't know how, I don't know why, but I suddenly pulled something in my back and was in like agony for five days and have people be like, Oh my God, was it stretching? Did you yawn too hard? Did you see, like, I want to, I want to be in those conversations that this book opened for me. Um, it is, it is a symbol of who gets to talk about this. Um, and I really appreciate that, you know, I'm like, well, if, if queer and gay people can talk about it now <laughs> and people are paying attention and buying this hard copy comic book, um, you know, then maybe they'll start listening to this, to the other stories. And maybe we can hear about it and not feel alone when, you know, I'm like, I'm not that old, but I don't know what I did to my back. You know, like I want the sort of freedom to be able to be in pain and to talk about it and to say, um, you know, like to, to, to crowdsource <laughs> resources and, and like, you're not alone. And this is common for, you know, this kind of body or this is common for this kind of, you know, activity or whatever, you know, even just to find that sort of like, I grip my teeth and live in pain every day. And so to not grip my teeth maybe a bit and say, this is really hurting and have somebody else go, oh my God, I'm in pain too. Let me tell you about it. It made me want to be in, in circles of, of black and brown women, especially talking about our bodies in that way of like, yeah, I've always been really athletic and now I suddenly can't do this thing or, you know, my body changed in this way and it's normal because our bodies do normal things <laughs> that nobody else experiences all the time. I think about too, like how many things I've counted myself out of because I don't know how to do them. And, and so much of my parenting of my kids has been about like making sure they can do the things that other kids can do. Like, has everyone learned to ski? Has everyone learned to, to kayak? Because other kids might know how to do it and you will know how to do it. You're not going to be the brown kid that doesn't know how to kayak. And I remember the summer before my older son went to college, I was like, oh my God, you've never been horseback riding. Oh my God, we got to get you on a horse. And he was like, no, what are you talking about? But it's this feeling that I've had, even with hiking, for a long time, like into my 20s, I was like, well, how does one hike? Literally, you just walk in the woods, right? But it felt like something that I had to have some gear, but then I'd have to ask a person about the gear. And it just all felt like um, like I couldn't reach it. And it, you know, and then there's danger, of course, of being like a woman in the woods. <laughs> and my mom kept a scrapbook of women in the woods who had disappeared, like she was that kind of lady <laughs> to this day. And um, you know, to discover like being in the woods sort of later in my life, probably in my thirties being like, okay, well, that's how I go. That's how I go. Um, because I need this and thinking of how differently I would relate one to my body and two to my connection to the world around me. If I had been encouraged or been given some, I don't know if I would have to be given it or if I would just take it this sort of sense of like adventure. Like I can, I can do this. I can figure it out. I can risk the fall. I can risk foolishness. And when you talk about the privilege of it, I think of that a lot of like, just like how many things I'm just so afraid to do because I don't, I don't even know how, and I'm afraid to ask the guy at REI and I'm just like, um, so I really appreciated her, like just being like, no, I just went out and did this thing. And I think it's early in the book. She's talking about like, I just started going and running this loop and I didn't tell my family I was doing it. And then all of a sudden I was running 10 miles. She just went and did it. And there was no, there wasn't like a barrier for her to doing it. But also there must have been like, she had the like comfort and privilege to like feel comfortable just going out and doing that. Like that, that exists too. Um, I loved that through line of running through the 
book because she came to it on her own. No one told her to do it. It wasn't encouraged. It wasn't like a school activity. Near the end of the book, she stopped running for a while, but then is running again. I just, I liked that connection to that thing that she chose as a kid. If I had read this book like a year ago, I would not at all be able to relate to the fitness part, but it came at the perfect time because I just started working out in March for the first time in like four years of just being totally sedentary. And I mean, but it's interesting to reflect on that decision in light of my identity and my experiences because it absolutely came because I wanted to get strong um, as a way to feel confident in the, as if I, if I were to be targeted from violence, essentially, um, particularly violent men. And I remember like I left, I ended last year experiencing um, a fear of violence and a real strong desire to be powerful and strong in the face of it as a, a woman of color who is five one. And um, I remember one of my students, she's a black woman, queer, um, is a bodybuilder and has like a whole YouTube series of bodybuilding and a lot of the discrimination she experiences um, being a black woman bodybuilding and was just so inspiring to me. And I, uh, and I told her, I was like, I think my new year's resolution next year is to join a martial art. And so I started, I thought it was going to be karate and it's, it was kickboxing and it's like the thing I did it as a teenager. I love it. I'm part of a boxing gym. I never thought I could like, it was the first class was so scary. And then I had a huge muscle pull that I thought was a heart attack and ended up in the ER thinking I was having a heart attack because of my first fit, like kickboxing class. Um, and now I'm going twice a week, trying to get to three times a week, but it's, it's probably like the biggest accomplishment I've experienced this year is just working out. Um, and then, you know, situationally, I am at high risk of cardiovascular disease. Like, it's such a huge deal for me. It's not something I take for granted. It's also really, I'm afraid of um, a disability. I'm afraid of hurting something. I've had really bad back pain that left me incapacitated. The whole, but the relationship with my body is at the center of my attention because of this um, in a way that feels like I'm like an infant learning something for the first time, which is like what it means to be embodied and move it and feel powerful and fear hurting it as well. Yeah. I felt like this reading this book was sort of like my past self and current self sort of arguing about who we are now, because during the pandemic, I decided to get fit or try to, and I did all this geeky research on how to do it. And then because of my shoulder disability, I hit my ceiling pretty fast. And then I ended up having a life changing, changing surgery two years ago. So now I can do so much more than I could. And the, the, the more I read the book and the, especially in the later years, I started to be able to connect more to what she was talking about. And that process of sort of hitting the ceiling on your body, but still feeling like you have to sort of put it through the paces somehow. So I feel like I'm just now in this like later part of my life starting to grapple with what my body can do and realizing that my body can do more than I think it can. But that scares me like a lot. Like I think this book scared me. I think that's why I feel very resistant to it because I think it frightened me about the, my own journey and relationship to health or fitness or wellness, which is something I think, you know, like I think for years I just was like, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather be someone who numbs myself than somebody who grapples with being in a body. But the last few years that hasn't been, not only has that not been possible. Um, yeah. So I just feel sort of like there are two sides of me that are at war when I read this book. That, that rings so true. That's, that's exactly the tug. While you were talking, I was thinking about um, how this has come up now again for probably the third or fourth time in a week. I think it was Hanif Abdelkarib who posted, um, these people were like, oh, daily consistent effort, moving your body is going to make you, you know, can make your mental health better, wah, wah, wah. And turns out they were right. And I'm kind of mad about it. Essentially, it was the post and like, um, like just doing a little bit every day, daily consistent effort, it turns out, is um, a real big thing. So I've been thinking, I've been ruminating on that and laughing about it because every time I don't do daily consistent, it doesn't have to be a lot, but you got to, if you do it every day and you do it consistently, turns out things are better. Things are less painful. Things are, you know, your mental health is better. And it's irritating that they were right. Cause I also would rather, 
I think I, I did um, spent most of my time numbing out. And then I'm also thinking about fucking Shani Nicholas, the astrologer, and how she's like, reparenting yourself, blah, 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 blah. How do you need to reparent yourself? And so when you were talking and you were talking about the like later in life and hitting the wall with your body, and I was just like, oh my God, this is an opportunity for me to like, no, I didn't get, get to go horseback riding and I didn't get to go skiing and I didn't get to, I didn't learn how to kayak. I mean, I can figure it out because I know how to swim, I guess. So I'm not scared, but I don't know how to kayak or paddleboard. Everybody fucking paddleboards now, right? Like I'm wondering like, where could I, could I find some joy in thinking of those things that were not for me and allowing my adult self to give myself that experience? Um, I've never done any snow sports. And even if it's ski lodge with some hot chocolate and do the whole snow bunny thing, like I was like, why not? I appreciate your emphasis on joy and just like what brings you, what brings us joy um, when we move our bodies and uh, thinking about the first time I did the kickboxing class, even though I thought I was having a heart attack afterwards, I also had it, it, like it was the same experience as if I'd taken a Valium and I was like, wait, what? And I was like, is this why people exercise? Like I had no idea that my mind would be so clear and peaceful and calm. And I didn't need medication for that. And, I was like, and um, you know, my dad would always, when I was depressed as a teenager, he would always, um, recommend that I go exercise when he was coming into his own queerness and coming out to himself. He absolutely hit the gym and was running, trying to get a six pack. I mean, that was his whole journey also. Um, but he then would say like, do this. And I, it, it felt like false. It felt a little, it wasn't deep enough. And now I'm seeing as I'm approaching 40, I've done so much therapy. I've done all the intellectual stuff, but like that kickboxing class removed my anxiety for the rest of the night. You know, it was a natural anti-anxiety pill, which is interesting. Yeah. The element of joy too is, I think something that I'm taking away from this book, like last year, my, uh, I had an event happen that basically forced me to be aware of my body. And then I was doing all these routines daily to like try to resolve what was going on. And I described it to my friends as like self-carrying myself into the ground because I was so stressed about all the Qigong I had to do, which is like ridiculous. But then this year I like went to a trampoline class and couldn't stop smiling the whole time because you're just like bouncing around like, like a little kid. And so I think... Yeah, it's like finding sort of the transition from feeling in a body to feeling like I am a body and finding the joy in that uh, as opposed to trying to control and regulate it, um, which seems to be like, like Bechtel seems to use her body as a, just, just seems to be very embodied in this way that is exciting to read about. Yeah, I love that it was also I'm going to be embodied in the way that makes sense in this particular era of my life, which I definitely appreciated so much as I'm in my 40s now. And I'm, I've always been very active and that has changed over the course of time. And And there's this trajectory when you're doing fitness that the more you do it, the better you're going to get. So why wouldn't you be a 40-year-old running in the same way that you did when you were a 30-year-old? But that's not how it works because bodies evolve. And it was so beautiful to see that play out on the page and, and be reflected back. Although it was that push pull still because I'm not a skinny, <laughs> athletically bodied white woman. I am a very not athletically bodied, short, <laughs> voluptuous black woman. So as much as I could relate, I there's all there was always this push pull the whole book. It's like, yes, but am I really like this person? And I almost feel like the fact that I had to consistently confront it, it it, it made me say, yeah, we we are alike, even though you know we know that there are some differences here. So I love Amber that you mentioned wanting to have more of these conversations about bodies and how they change and how we all experience these different parts of our life and and pain differently so that we can see that the common thread is that we have the experiences, but also recognize that we're all going through them in a different way. 
It's interesting, both what you said and um, Maiden, what you were saying about um, less being in a body and more being a body. Um, along the t- Around the time that I saw Hanif's post, I saw Mary Lambert posting about her body as well. And she did this video. She was talking about how um, she found herself struggling with this concept of like, with like the self-love concept, this idea of, of body love and like loving on her body. And, and when she unpacked it, she realized that it was, um, that felt like a separate, like keeping the separation, a false separation that no longer felt true, um, that she was, she was her body, her body was her, and it was not this thing that she was doing to something outside of herself, which is like how we often have to approach self-care right is to like be like okay i have to care for the skin suit because they tell me i'll feel better if i do or because something happened and now i'm in pain or whatever it is and that 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 sense of becoming like integrated in that way um realizing my i had a coach who was like your body is always on your team and i was like bitch no first of all <laughs> that is not true it's not facts like I can point out times when my body has been against me and it's like against who me who was the me that your body was against and actually my mind is a real tricky fucker right like is actually the one who was pitting this war and my body's just out here literally trying to breathe like that's like it's it's just trying to get through right so that was it's been this breaking open of how do I get to a point where I'm not wishing for like a stronger, healthier body. I'm looking for a stronger, healthier me. And what that means is a lot more. It's not just how I physically feel, but mentally how connected I am. Those kind of moments are coming now in my 40s where I'm like, oh, I'm trying to be this. This body is me as much as like the mind and everything I create and everything I produce and all the work I like. The product of the mind is is actually the product of my body as well. I can only do it because of this body. And so, yeah, that integration piece is like, it's tricky. And I think, I don't know, like, can it come sooner? Like, I would really love for my teenage child to be embodied from the beginning because I think it would be easier. Um, and healing would be, like, literal physical healing would be easier as well. Seema, you're nodding your head. You think You think it can come earlier? I think what I was nodding my head about was I was thinking about being that age and having like pleasure be no part of my health education, no part of my any kind of education. I also grew up in a pretty strict Islamic household. And so like pleasure is just absolutely besides the point, right? Like that's just like not the thing. And as I have gotten older and moving my body is as much about like not being an asshole to myself and others as it is about, you know, like anything to do with, you know, what I can make my body look like or more about that. I have begun to think about like what feels good and let's do that. And that's the check-in with myself this year. I have decided to start doing this kind of workout. The average age of my fellow workouters is 75. It's called the perfect workout. It's very strong weights, very, very slowly. And it's like 20 minutes of horror. And one of the things, and I've like decided to give it a year, but one of the things that they always tell us when you're there, you're with a trainer and there's no music and it's very clinical. And they're like, "Um, it's not supposed to be fun. That's recreation this is exercise. And so I'm like giving it this go and just thinking about like, but it's supposed to like strengthen your bone density to do it this way and like reverse osteoporosis. So I'm doing this thing to care for my body so that I can do the things that I find joyous. Right. So like my ankles, I have a hard time with ankles and shin splints and like, how do I correct these things so that I can continue to enjoy my body. I was also thinking about this book that I read by, I, she, she was like a hospital chaplain and a death doula. And there was, it was like all of these interactions she had with people who were dying. And one of the things that somebody said when they were alone with her, a woman who was at the end of her life, she said, you know, I'm going to miss my family, going to miss my kids. But the thing I'm going to miss most of all is my body more than anyone else. I'm going to miss her. 
And that has struck me as a different way to think about her. I'm thinking of the question that Amber posed and that Simon you started to answer also about can like at an early age, can this be taught? And I'm thinking about, I'm just really sitting on that question because I'm thinking like somehow in socialization, and I do think um, and the degree of this is dependent on people's social identities in an oppressive world as well. But like we find solace in dissociating from our bodies because they're under assault. Um, and so, um, or they're shamed or that, right. They're under assault from racism. They're shamed from racism and, uh, sexuality and gender, right. Like everything. It's like, oh gosh, there's so really, um, there's a reclamation here, right. Like, um, so important. Yeah. To just reclaim the body, uh, and relate to It's also very painful. I think like if the dissociation has been severe, um, yeah, so I just wonder like what what a socialization looks like that doesn't force people to dissociate from their bodies at an early age and how to like cultivate that not only in families but like in cultures and societies. Ugh, I relate to that so much, Nisha, just thinking about who gets to be embodied and how so much is put on our bodies that has absolutely nothing to do with us, um, whether it's religion or whether it's, you know, how bodies are exoticized or racialized. It's like stepping back into that body, that integration is as beautiful as it sounds, it's also so incredibly painful to see what has been done to your body. Um, and we see we see some of that happening in this book, but it 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 hits different when it's coming from that marginalized perspective, I think. Yeah, I think what happens, like where you're saying, like what has been done to our bodies, there's a grief that has to happen in the accompaniment of like being of of claiming the body and loving it. Yeah. It's a grieving process as well. And it's lost time, you know, that you you can't recover that, you know, we can, we can exercise and we can eat well, and we can do all of these things that make our body feel like a comfortable place that maybe help to mitigate some pain. But the, the, the grieving of that lost time of, I can't go back to that five-year-old body and allow it to, to be in a space of privilege to be able to ski, right? Um, though I may be able to recover that at this age if I decide I detest cold, so I won't. But it's, I have to take the time to grieve what I was not able to offer this body um, and the assumptions that were made about it so that in this current iteration of freedom, I can actually like step fully into this, this physical body. I wanted to go back to the idea of joy, um, which I don't, I don't think I feel that when it comes to the stuff going on with my body, I feel grimly determined. And then I feel satisfaction after the fact, but I don't think I feel joy. I'll have moments of euphoria, but I think I'm, I, I wonder if some of that is what we're talking about, about sort of how early does integration have to happen in order for you to be able to sort of effortlessly, like I think of joy as a kind of effortlessness maybe um, also, but, but I think one of the things I did connect to that I really appreciated in this book is how often she called herself out for being an overachiever and a solitary kind of like determined overachiever. I didn't necessarily feel like she was getting a lot of pleasure from what she was doing as much as she felt insistent upon it and that I definitely connected to as a grimly determined overachiever myself um, and the idea of sort of wanting to max out in a way you know whatever max out your own potential and then sort of continue to level up there's a part in the book later in the book where she says how many levels are there to this game which I really appreciated as a as a way of thinking about um how many phases there are in which you know she's she's simultaneously also experiencing so much huge professional success that she feels clearly ambivalent about also. It's not like her professional success is necessarily, it is at odds with what's going on in her personal life. There are these three different parts of her life. There's her personal life, there's her professional life, and then there's this consistent 
deeply rigorous relationship she has to her body. I think it was interesting to see those three parts of her life in interaction with each other and how those different parts were not necessarily balanced at the same time. And Tarfia, what you just said made me think of even the like beginnings of her interest in like muscles was like a desire to be self-sufficient. That comes up throughout the book. I think about when she goes back to that wall to, that she has to climb over at her college orientation and pulls herself up just to prove she could do it, even though the point of the exercise was to like use the people around you to get over this obstacle. Um, so she's aware of of that like behavior. She's aware of of how that's like damaging to her or how it's like not the right thing, but she still, it's not like it stops after that incident where she's self-aware. Um, and I appreciated that. I Also with her relationship to like alcohol throughout the book, I appreciated that it wasn't just like, and then I saw that I should stop drinking and I did and now everything is better. Like I like that she was honest about being aware of things, but still not making changes. I think that also made her, I don't know if tolerable is the right word here. That seems kind of unfair. But I, but you know, like, I think I was just like, you bike 10 miles? Like, I can't, you know, like, as somebody who was just now, I wouldn't even call myself athletic. I would, I would say that I show up and I get through the thing, <laughs> whatever the term for that is. Um, a get throughist? I don't know. But, um, but I, I too appreciated that, you know, like, she was sort of, not necessarily so I guess like because I think this goes back to maybe the idea of wellness or the place of wellness in our society and why to Amber's point about you know what you were saying about Hanif's post why we find so much of those gurus or influencers so insufferable is because you know there is no <laughs> there is no um easy route to joy or happiness or transcendence you know like it's like it's difficult and it's painful and it's tiring and you have to do it every single day. I think what, when Amber asked the question about youth and like being young and connected to your body, I, as we've been talking about this and the way that her pursuit is kind of untied from productivity, it's untied from what her job is. Like you play as a little kid and then organized sports I've seen with my kids like take over and become this, like, is this your pathway to, um, and they like injure themselves and they, they, there's, there's this sort of productivity, external productivity, external measurement that's added to it that I think also divorces kids from their joy early on. And I think one of the things that's really wonderful about being in my body and doing these things right now is like, there's no way nobody is going to like draft me to any team at all. <laughs> like I am just doing this for me. I go to the baseball game and I'm ready for them to call me in, but they never do. <laughs> but you know, it's a sort of like, um, there is a freedom from knowing that this, this is like, this is not for anything. And I think there are few things that exist like that in adult life that are like, I don't know, sanctioned as a thing to do with your time. That just feels like it just brought like for what me, I thought was one of the most important parts of the book it was in the middle when her mother was dying and um, she was sitting by her bedside before she had died. And she just, there's just one panel. And it was like, I realized like, this is, this is what so-and-so means. It's about being and not doing. And it was just these, this like, it's, it seems like just one singular moment in her life in which she truly understood what it meant to be and not do. Um, and it, I mean, it, which is such a Buddhist, um, that's like the Buddhist motto, right? Is like, how do you transcend doing for being? And I, it's just kind of interesting because I hear on one hand, Seema, you being like, oh, like the exercise was the place where she didn't have to do, she was being, but she was still doing in my perspective. It's like a whole book of doing, 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 even when she's trying not to do, 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 do professionally, she's do, 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 do fitness wise. Um, even if, you know, for herself and not others, it's just constant motion. Like it's um, frenetic 
uh, busyness and action and movement and productive and that just the, those moments by her mom's bedside. I mean, they seem so poignant in the spectrum of like this life that she's shown us of, of her life. Yeah. I've come to this place too, where there's like, I realized that I had spent my entire life up to this point, prioritizing what my brain was capable of doing, what I was capable of showing. Um, this is definitely tied to abandonment issues and therapy around, you know, commitment, phobia and all the things. Right. But like, ultimately, you know, the, the whole thing of, I don't know if you saw, I think Sonia Renee posted this thing where it was like, what is something that your therapist told you that like blew your mind? And it was like, you continue to have a fear of abandonment because at any chance you're given, you immediately abandon yourself. And I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> I feel approached sis. Um, so like approaching my, my issues essentially like these deep um, fears and phobias um, from this perspective of like, where have I given up on myself? And I think um, I spent a lot of my life, proving that I was worthy of love by showing what I could create and what I could think and what I could, you know, like the, the journey of journaling and writing poems just for the pleasure of writing is, is a thing of the past. Like that's not to say I don't write poems and get pleasure out of them. That's not to say I don't write things just for fun, but I have to remember to do those things. I have to remember like, this doesn't have to be a collection yet. You don't have to know where you're going with this. You don't know, how, you have to make it into something because that's what I've done with, with the creations of my mind. And so when I hit this thing with my knee and it became a thing and I was like, what am I going to do? I, I sort of like hit me that I had never, I had never prioritized my body for any extended amount of time or any kind of consistent way. I never had challenged to see how far, how creative I could be with my body, um, how, um, how, you know, what it was capable of in the way that I had given my mind, like, look at how capable I am of making and creating and writing and letting it run the show, letting my mind run the show this whole time and, and numbing out the body as much as possible to not feel the pain of it. And so sitting in the pain of it, sitting in the like, like most of that stuff comes down to really physical things for me, like re really physical abandonments, fears. And, um, and so as I'm facing my, my shit, right. And, and deciding what kind of person I want to become now, um, it has been interesting to, to just stop thinking about it for a minute. And I think what you're pointing out in that moment with at her mom's bedside and then at the end too, where she gets to this moment where she's like, we're getting up at dawn and I reluctantly gave up me and I'm not drinking again. And I'm sitting there in the silence and like, and like tapping into that is um, <laughs> it takes practice to get silence enough to hear your body. Um, or it takes practice for me to get silent enough to hear my body, shall I say. And, and so the thing that, that got me this idea of like the secret to superhuman strength um, is that I've always been really, really strong. I'm the kind of girl who could lift the boys up. I'm the kind of, I wanted to play on the boys team. Like, I, I think I just rewrote that story in my brain. At some point, I gave up what my body had been capable of and had been showing me I was capable of all the time. And now I'm just simply actually listening and like remembering the stories of remember how you actually hurt that knee was in dance class, leaping like a gazelle across the floor. Then you landed wrong. You're 16 and you shook it off because you're strong. It, there, there are stories that I have not given space to tell. What if for one year, the first thing was I had to like listen, like every day practicing listening to my body. What does that mean to sit and be in it, be in my physical stew <laughs> and to like tap into the gurgles and the rebounds and the twinges and the aches and all of that. And, um, and isn't that, isn't that its, its own, um, like who, who else is going to give me permission? I love this idea of like, love missing my body the most. It's like, I am going to miss being Amber flame. Like I'm going to miss that. And so I'm not going to miss any more of it while I'm, while I'm Amber flame, you know, like I'm going to try to not miss any more of this, this embodiment because no matter what, it won't happen again. That was so beautiful. I mean, I teared up 
just listening to you re-narrate the story of your body. I experienced you as very joyous as you were describing your own journey with your body and restoring it. So thank you for that. That makes me think of another dichotomy, which is sort of, you know, she's not talking about thinness, which is so different than fitness. Um, and I was really struck by just kind of maybe even the sheer lack of aesthetics in general, because as somebody who doesn't even own any practical clothing, as Seema knows, um, just I don't own very much practical clothing at all. Most of my interest, some of my interest in being fit is about vanity. Like I want to look good and what I wear and I want to feel whatever that whole thing is. Right. But I felt like fascinated by the fact that Alison Bechdel is not thinking about that at all, it seems like. I mean, there's not ever any acknowledgement at all of um, thinness or aesthetics or clothing even, except in this, you know, the Patagonia outlet, which I also could not relate to. But I need more practical clothing. I think that was one thing I got from reading this book is that I actually maybe need to go to the Patagonia outlet um, because I think that for me, I was sort of raised to think about how I look more than about how I feel. And so I think that this book is a sort of call to think about how you feel versus how you look. And I may be somewhere in between. I don't, you know, I like fashion and I like clothing and, you know, all of that stuff. I like makeup, et cetera. Um, but, I, but I found it refreshing to remember that there is another route. I'm thinking she does talk about her six pack abs at the end. Yeah. Like for me, I'm thinking about women in appearance, but also bodybuilding and um, achieving muscle. And like, that's something that because part of my impetus, um, like the kick, you know, like I want to be, I want to feel strong. I want to be able to feel like I can fuck shit up and I can like injure somebody if needed in a self-defense kind of a way. And I noticed I would like start, like, there's nothing here, but I do this. Like it feels more, you know, and then I've just been, so I, there has been a desire in me to sculpt muscle and it's just, it's just a fantasy. It's never going to happen. Um, but particularly as a woman, um, it's like this other type of appearance or aesthetic or body sculpting that I didn't know was possible, which is about bodybuilding. Yeah. It's maybe inspired by my student who's, you know, breaking the gendered way of looking at fitness in that respect. When I was a kid, my mom, just as a hobby, started doing uh, weightlifting and she, as a part-time job, uh, we had like a gym in our basement, just a couple weight machines and she trained pageant contestants. Um, she like was a, a <laughs> like bodybuilding coach for pageant contestants. And I remember being down there as a kid and there were these like, like beautiful women who were just like absolutely crushing weights and they were so strong. Well, and also we're taught to focus on the fact that Beyonce is fine and has these phenomenal outfits and not the fact that to carry that concert for you know a couple hours over and over and over and over again requires a kind of training that none of us I don't I can I can say based on what you shared today none of us are on that level of training and so we we forget we're, we're taught not to pay attention to how much strength it takes to be beautiful even like the, the things we're not we don't look at anybody I, you know I think of um so Weedy, Megan, the style, I think of these people who I look at and see how they dress or see how what they're putting out there and just be like, that's hot, or I hate that or whatever my judgment of the fashion is. And, and not think about like, the, like the tiredness of the body, like after I've done a row of shows, of readings of poetry, <laughs> for my book, I'm like, Oh, my God, my body is so tired of performing. And like, that's not no that's nowhere near the level of this like the, what it takes to walk in those heels now I know I'm very aware of every muscle it takes to walk in some heels and to do it for two hours while dancing and singing and you know like we we, we forget that our image of beauty especially in this day and age is very much framed around the strength of that individual person and the training that goes into that individual I loved watching them Gabby Union and Dwayne Wade working out and they're, they're like anything you can do I can do better like competitive thing because it's like right she works her ass off and she has the privilege and money and resources and blah 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 of course but like she spends multiple hours a day towards this I think that's what I meant with like my 
commitment to my body. I'll spend hours reading and writing and doing those things. What if I took some of those hours and said, my body deserves a chunk of hours a day for feeding and resting and, you know, water and, you know, like the things that it needs. Somebody gave me the poster of Marilyn Monroe doing on a weight, on a weightlifting bench with lifting weights. And it's the only picture of her I truly, truly love because it's just her in some like cuff jeans doing some, some um, bench presses. And I'm like, yes, this is, you forget it takes work to move through our, move through our lives. It takes body work to move through our lives. Just branching off of some of the things that have been said, it was also cool to see. I, I remember in high school, I like saw on maybe good morning America while my mom was watching it, this, this program where you worked out in heels. Cause it was like better for your butt. And then I would start, I started working out in heels, which feels insane to remember. But there was like, you know, I had a, an ab routine from 17 magazine taped to my door and like just these, these routines that I was in from this place of wanting to be womanly or feminine. Tarvia, I think you already be- touched on this, but it was really nice to see Bechdel being drawn, like looking at herself in the mirror with her arms out to be like, what would it be like to be hugely muscular and wide? And I was, I caught myself feeling surprised by it because when I was young, that was not what I was thinking about is like, how can I be as strong as possible? And there's something really lovely about that. Anyway, it's crazy to think that I used to work out in heels. I really did completely forget. (laughs) I'm having this sort of, and I don't know exactly how to exact to voice it, but I'm having this discomfort with the idea of like how tired isn't beautiful, how disability isn't beautiful, how like all of this is around like the superhuman. I, I think this is like part of this thing with the the trauma of aging and and the you know idea of being discarded when our bodies speak out and when our bodies can't do things that I don't know, maybe they just shouldn't do anymore. Like I'm just going to take care of these teeth. The idea that you can only enjoy your body if it's able to perform is a thing that like gravity is often trying, is always trying to take away from all of us, right? Like genuinely, truly. And, you know, and could, and could in the next hour or tomorrow or whatever. And how do we prepare ourselves to love our bodies through that and to love other people's bodies, which I don't expect us to answer in the next five minutes, but I did want to name it for anybody in our community who is listening and is like, oh, these are a bunch of able-bodied people. Not not able-bodied. I am officially disabled, first of all. And second, I, I think of the just I just wanted to say this. Somebody posted this as well. And I've been getting a lot of wisdom from online, apparently. Um, somebody said that um, being disabled is like the largest minority group that you can join at any time, that anyone can join at any time. And so, like, yeah, context is everything, right? Like, we're, we have been talking about very able-bodied people generally. One thing that I was thinking about also is that I, I, I kind of like, I think I'm realizing I'm taking Bechdel's latest book as a giant Zen riddle. <laughs> and I don't know if she's saying the secret to superhuman strength is in being able-bodied because she's constantly experiencing her body breaking down to mortality. Um, and it brings me back to, um, it brings me back to her uh, sitting with her dying mother. And I'm like, to me, I'm like, that was that was the that was the moment in which she had the secret to superhuman strength was in her presence while sitting with her mother. And I think it is a, a moment in which the mind body were, I'm assuming, united. Um, you know, you think, but I, yeah, I mean, I just find this whole book to be a riddle and completely ironic. And that that's the brilliance of the self-awareness of like, yeah, like it could absolutely be um, read in this kind of able-bodied privileged way and we we have been focusing on that a lot in this conversation as well the power of that but I actually am like I don't think that's 
I think she was being ironic about that whole thing. <laughs> there was these like tiny moments where she could transcend that need to prove to herself something with both the mind independent and the body independent. Like these moments where they actually came together. Um, for me, I only saw it when she was with her mother. Thanks for listening to our discussion of The Secret to Superhuman Strength. Special thanks to Nisha Gupta, Rachel Heath, Tarfia Faizula, Amber Flame, and Maiden Wood for being part of the conversation. If you have thoughts about the book, email us at cbawloves at cbaw.org to share. One of our listeners had this to say about the book. Another beautifully crafted book by Alison Bechdel. The amount of care that goes into each page is so evident. Every time I read one of her books, I learn something new about life, literature, and history. I loved being brought on this journey, from the rigorous pursuit of exercise for all the wrong reasons, to balancing expectations, reality, and even facing death. The next book we'll be reading is In the Shelter by Padre Gotwama. Thanks for listening. CBAW Loves is a community building artworks podcast produced by Amelia Bain with music by Rose Blakelock. CBAW is committed to mission belonging, reconnecting veterans with their communities. For more information, visit our website, www.cbaw.org.